right, well, we want to welcome you back for part two. Of our training today. And so, again, for those streaming online, you can go to one of our Facebook pages that are, I know for a fact it's differently on both Facebook pages on the Holy Trinity site. It is right there in the, uh, in the how to host a small group training today post. Uh, it's connected right there as a JPEG. You can download it and print it off right there. Uh, I've got the third page. It says part two. For those who are following on our Revolution Church page, uh, that is actually under the files. You have to go into files and pull down the, uh, and it's right at the top there. It'll say how to host a small group, and that will be in PDF format. So again, you're welcome to pull off part two. Right now we're going to get into the second part, which is more the nitty gritties of how you host a small group in your home. Now, let me start by saying that you do not have to have it in your home. We actually have uh, one person that's going to have it, at, like Panera Bread. I think it's fantastic. Uh, I've done small groups in Panera Bread. Uh, I have one person who's going to do it here. Well, I'm doing one here. And then somebody else is, we have two groups that are actually going to be meeting in the fellowship hall. And that's fine. You have to play that one by ear. Again, it depends on who you're asking because some people just will, again, not come to a church building. It depends on who you're inviting and asking. It's one of the reasons, like in one of my small groups, we do, uh, for the youth group, we participate in a thing called Young Life. Young Life is a nationwide and worldwide organization whose sole purpose is to make sure that every teenager has the opportunity to be introduced to a relationship with Christ. And they have a policy of not, we just do not have our Young Life uh, programs in church buildings. Because, again, that tends to be a stumbling block for some of the teens. You just have to make that evaluation. So in your home, Panera Bread, uh, McDonald's, don't care. Wherever it works out best for you. But the one thing you do need to do is make sure wherever environment you're in, it is a welcoming environment and it is comfortable. That uh, one of the things that you can do, uh, these are just some suggestions, they're not, they're guidelines. So nothing here is set in stone, but you need to evaluate your people that are coming. Maybe you want to bake some cookies. I'll tell you what, there's nothing like coming into a house where you smell baked cookies. I'm coming. Okay, bake some cookies. They don't have to be, you know, just get the store-bought kind. I don't care. Whatever you want to do, bake some cookies or put something out. Put out some drinks, some snacks. Here today, this is more of an educational environment than it is a small group environment. And that's kind of intentional. You need to be able to write here. But if I were doing a small group here in this space, I'd be going over to the couches, you know, where people can kind of curl up and, you know, snuggle up and, and just be a little bit more comfortable. You still put some of the drinks out here. For those, again, watching and streaming, you can't see this, but we do have some coffee here that's available for folks, some fruit, and I brought some donuts for today. So, just something, because uh, sometimes people like to have something nibble on while they're talking and just makes it come. Just comfort type of food. It's, it's often good to play some music in the background. During the break, you know, I intentionally had Terry play some music. I think that's important. Get a CD player or, you know, whether maybe you're using some type of online device. Uh, just play some music in the background while people are gathering. I think people are more comfortable if there's some noise. Sometimes they feel self-conscious that every conversation is being listened to by everybody and maybe they have a private conversation they like to have with one other person. The music kind of gives them a feeling that they have that confidentiality and that security. So it's kind of a nice thing to have music in the background. Uh, there is a question about that that some of you might ask, well, should it be Christian music? Should it? Not, not necessarily. Remember the groups that you're dealing with. When I do Young Life and I'm working with the teenagers, I, I rarely play Christian music. Most of it is contemporary music. Now, I make sure that it's music that doesn't have uh, some things that are inappropriate for the uh, context. I don't, you know, it, it's not going to be a song about sex, and it's not going to be a song with a lot of swear language in it or about drugs or whatever. So I do monitor some of the music that we do. But yes, I play uh, the music that's popular with the kids today so they can feel comfortable in the environment. So it just depends on your group. 
if you've got a group of folks that are mainly church people, which is okay, by the way, maybe I haven't said this before, it is okay if everybody in your group goes to a different church or goes to church already. It's okay. I'm okay with that. It's still going to have a purpose of strengthening your relationship with God and with each other. That is so critical and so important. You know, but if you've got people who are primarily not churched, uh, they're going to be comfortable with a different group of music. So whatever you like. All right, number two, be prepared. Uh, I would ask that you make sure that you go over the lesson before you get there. Don't just wing it. That is always a bad thing. So make sure you know where everything's at. Make sure your papers are set up. Make sure anything that needs to be copied is copied and printed if you need anything. Make sure your DVD and TV is ready if you're going to stream the lesson through DVD or TV or whatever multimedia device that you're going to be using is prepared. I mentioned, I, I didn't mention this, so I will mention it now. In your class, there will be a 10-minute video that I will be doing to help you with your classes. It's going to help you get into Bible study for the day. We are going to provide you with multiple, multiple ways to be able to view that depending on your context. So uh, if you're at your home and you've got a DVD player and a TV, bam, we'll have a DVD for you. You can use it. If you're at Panera Bread, you're not going to have a DVD player and a DVD. You might have, you might just have a little, um, your, you might have your iPad or some other device like that. Uh, and that's great. That's fine. We will make sure that you are able to stream that on our YouTube channel. Okay? So you just make, need to make sure that wherever you're at, that those devices are working properly. You hate to go to Panera Bread and all of a sudden, oh, you know what, that file won't stream because, you know, Panera is blocking our site or something like that. I don't know. I mean, I hate to say that there are some sites that they'll block certain places where you just can't go to. So make sure you test out whatever device you're using beforehand. As I will say, I think the 10-minute video that I'm going to do in presentation for every small group will really, really be a huge help to you. Um, because if you don't have that, there are actually some questions that are going to be related to that 10-minute presentation that you're going to miss out on. Now, worst case scenario, technology fails, right? I will publish all of the scripts for that 10-minute video. So you will have that. So that's one thing you need to be prepared for. You need to think through every single contingency. What happens if the power goes out and now I don't have that? It's going to happen to somebody. What happens if my streaming service doesn't work? It's going to happen. What happens if I put the DVD in there and the DVD scratch and I can't get it? Well, you need to make sure that you have a copy of the script so you can read the script. I know it's not perfect, but it's better than nothing, right? So we just do, we just need to make sure you're prepared for that. All right, Bibles. <clears throat> it's a good thing to have at least one or two Bibles there because we will be looking at the Bible. If people do not have Bibles, please let me know. The church gets Bibles that we will provide for anybody who does not have one for free. So if you know that you're going to need two or three Bibles and you need to take some, please grab them. We will make sure that you're supplied those things. Uh, all of your supplies, DVDs, everything like that, you can pick up here, obviously not today. We're not prepared for that. But by next Sunday, when we have our very first Sunday, all of those materials that you need, we'll have Bibles set out, we'll have small group Bible studies set out for you that you can take that are already printed if you don't want to print them out. We'll have scripts that can, you can take for you from the, the Bible lessons that I will be doing that you can take with you. We'll have everything there. If you prefer, prefer to have hard copies of everything, it will be available next Sunday to you. Or again, if you're more technologically astute and you just don't care about the printed stuff, where can you go again? Oh, that's right. Holy Trinity East PGH.com. Everything will be there. You know it by now? I hope so. Okay. All right, so be prepared. Small group rules. These are important, and I think it's important that you print these or at least print, uh, you know, your compilation of these, but uh, in some way. I will actually have this printed in every single booklet that's a small group booklet that every person's going to have. 
So it'll be in the booklet that you get for every member of your small group. But everything, these are small group rules. Everything that is said in your small group is confidential. Everything. Somebody might be there without their spouse. And they're going to say, oh, I'm having such a hard time because my spouse is such a putz. Um, I do not want to hear word of that back to me. Somebody saying, oh, you should have heard what such and such said about uh, such and such a person. I don't care. I'm not that person's pastor. You are. Your job is to make sure that that stays confidential. The people in your group need to keep those things confidential. Uh, there cannot, otherwise we're just a gossip, we're just a bunch of gossip mon mongers, okay? Now, obviously, if there's something that's dangerous and somebody has, uh, and, and, you know, we've got uh, people working in health care fields and the counseling fields and, and uh, the civil, certainly civil service, yeah, um, what am I thinking of? Social Human life. services field, like you do, Jen, and so forth. You know that there are certain things that are just dangerous. If somebody's threatening suicide or to hurt themselves in some way, those are things you do not mess around with. Those are things that you cannot keep confidential that must be reported. If you do not know how to do that, you call me. If you're exactly. dealing with something like that, I will show you where to go, but that needs to be dealt with immediately. And the best thing to do is you do not let the person out of your sight because you need to make sure that person is safe. Um, there are other things if they are confessing to something in your group that they murdered somebody, sorry, but that is, uh, uh, that you don't keep confidential either. <laughs> Those things need to be reported. Uh, we cannot, we cannot, uh, um, we've had, and I, let me just tell you a story with this. We actually had a, Remember the church who was sexually molesting children. And I found out about this. I am responsible as a pastor to report that immediately. And I can't mess around with that. And I actually, I, gave, I told that person, they, they came and confessed to me this. And I said, you know, I'm just telling you, open up a door. This must be reported. Oh, you can't do that. You can't. I said, listen. I'm telling you right now, you're picking up the phone right now and you're reporting yourself or I will report you. Well, he wasn't going to report himself, so I reported him. Next thing you know, I get a call from another pastor who just rips into me. You betrayed the confidentiality of the confessional. You can't do that. I said, excuse me. I said, this guy has been molesting children. And so I'm going to maintain the confidentiality of, of, of the confessional uh, at the cost of some other kid in the future. It is your job. That is just immoral. I can't believe you did that. And I said, well, you know what? I'm going to stand in front of God and tell God, I betrayed the confidentiality of the con confession to report this guy who is molesting children so he would no longer molest children. And I'm going to say that to God, and you're going to stand before God and say, oh, God, I maintain the confidential of uh, my confessional. This guy confessed to me that he was a child molester, and he went on to molest ten more children, but hey, look at me, I'm a good guy, right? I said, who do you think is going to be held accountable before God? I said, I think I'm going to be better off with my conscience standing before God because I will protect it, ten more children from getting molested. We cannot mess with this type of stuff. There are certain things that if they are made, if there's a confession made, I'm not trying to tell you that there will be, but there are certain things that you have to understand that if they put people's lives at risk, those things must be reported. You must protect any future uh, person who would be victim of, of these types of things. If you don't know how to do that, you please talk to me. Now, I again laid out the worst case scenario. You know what? 99.99999% of the time that's not going to happen, but that does bear to be mentioned that you need to be understanding that these things can't come out on occasion in small groups. Most, For the most part, it's going to be gripes about their spouses or frustrations with coworkers or frustrations about their lives or uh, maybe they're frustrated with uh, their health problems or maybe they're frustrated with uh, their inability to lose their weight that they'd like to or this or that. All of those things have to still be kept in confidence. You cannot betray a person's confidence. Because remember, the purpose of this is connecting with other people. They need to trust you. That you're not going to go and blab this stuff. And everybody in the group needs to understand that this is a confidential group. Always. Okay? That means you don't even go home and tell your 
spouses what happens in these groups. Okay? Now, I will say this. Uh, Jen, again, working in the healthcare profession and so forth, you know that on occasion we do not have the abilities to deal with certain things that we, you know, maybe that somebody comes and says to us and we need some advice, then I think it's okay sometimes to go to somebody else and say, look, I'm not sure how best to address this issue. Can you help me? But you don't have to tell the person's name. You can maintain that person's confidence, but say a generic type of thing. Uh, you can do that for me as your pastor, because I am committed to confidentiality. I, I will not say what other people are struggling with. So if, you are, if you're not sure how to address something, it is appropriate to come and talk to me or some other small group of leaders and say, how would you deal with this type of situation that's in your small group? And that, but that is not a betraying of confidence. You don't have to mention the person's name. Okay? So, remember, second bullet point in our small group rules, the purpose is ultimately the fellowship, not the Bible study. That's kind of surprising. But you need to understand your first purpose is to make sure that you're connected with other people and secondarily you get to the Bible study. That's, that's certainly important. Fellowship and then Bible study. I want you to try to limit your time, third bullet point, to 75 minutes. That's really important. It is a busy time, a busy age, and people need to know that there's a beginning and an ending point to these small groups. And if these small groups run three hours and people just don't know how long they're going to go, they're not going to come back. They're going to get really exhausted. Um, and so you say, look, it's going to be 75 minutes. I make sure, you make sure as a small group leader, it is done in 75 minutes. Now, if people want to stay and talk and you're okay with that, that's fine. But there are ways to get people out the door. Do you want to know a way to get people out the door? Because you might have to go to work the next day. How do you get people out the door? Okay, you pray, you say amen. I'm so glad you guys came. That's what I'm doing. I am standing up, and guess what I'm doing? I'm making my way to the door. Subtle hint, people. It's time to go. You don't have to be rude, but... You can say, all right, well, I'm so grateful we can't. I'm looking forward to seeing you guys next week. And I would say this standing up at that point. We're done with our prayer. I'm so grateful you all came. I'm looking forward to next week. I've got to get, get ready for bed tonight, and, and I look forward to that. God bless you guys all. And you just make their way over. You go grab their coats. You give it to them, and you push them out the door. Now, if you're okay if they stay and talk 15 minutes, that's up to you. But it's also on you. Please do be aware that there are some people that will stay forever if you allow them. Now, notice my last phrase. If you allow them. So you have to, there, there's always, every group seems to have that one person who just likes to monopolize the conversation and just wants all the attention on themselves. You have to make sure that doesn't happen. And so this is one way, it's one technique that you can use to get them out of the house. Okay? All right, um, notice the next one. Uh, this kind of goes with that very thing. Don't allow one person to dominate the conversation. This is really important because, as I said, there's always that one person that likes to make it about themselves, and they get off topic very quickly as well, too. We, we have some in our church that like to do that. And you're on a certain area, next thing you know, they try to get you to another tangent that goes in the direction they want to go in. You know, we're focusing on... The Bible study when we get there. Okay, don't allow them to do that. How do you do that? Well, if, if, if you just say, hey, we've got to focus on that's taking us away from the Bible study here today. Okay, when you finally get into the Bible study, we need to focus on the question. You're the, you're the one that arbitrates what can and cannot be said and who does and does not speak. If you find that there's a tendency for one person to monopolize, call on people. It's okay to call on people. You could say, Terry, you know, so I, I ask the question, instead of just leaving it open ended, say, Terry, what do you think about this? If Terry's comfortable with that. Because you also know there are some people that are, um, that do not like to be called on. And they kind of shy away from that. So be careful of that. Make sure you know it's somebody that you've got a good relationship with and can do that. You know, and I mentioned Terry because Terry's that type of person in our church. I know that Terry's going to give a concise answer to it, and he's going to get us going in the right direction, and he'd be comfortable with me asking him that. There are other people, like my daughter, for instance, she would just, she's, she'd be a wallflower. She would, she would not appreciate being pointed out like that. 
And so you just need to be, uh, make sure that you evaluate that. So uh, hopefully you have that one strong person in your group that you can call that help you keep things moving in the right direction. Um, and, and it is okay to stop people in the middle of conversation. You know, if they're starting to go on a tangent, say, well, that's kind of off topic, so can we get back to this? You can do it politely. You know, but that's, you kind of have to also be firm. Dave, if I can comment on that. Please do. Uh, one way to draw people out, if you notice someone who keeps making direct eye contact with you, sometimes right. you can say, you look like you have something to say. That's a good point. Because a lot of point. times they're kind of waiting for an invitation. They right. don't know if they should interrupt. Right. Yeah, you, you'll be able to know. And there's body language. But the people who don't want to be called on have their head down like this. <laughs> do not ever call on them. Let them come when they're ready. Okay? Like I said, the people are like... And you'll see them. They're like this. They're like this. But they'll, mm, but they'll never say a darn word. And it's like, say something. Well, and then, so if you have somebody like that, right on. That is really good observation, Jen. Yeah, call on them. Hey, Dave. Yes. The other thing, too, is when you talk about not having someone dominate the conversation, and I know later on you have the time frame, a way to keep yourself grounded is to talk about the ground rules, like you said. Right. You could even... Put them on a poster of what's your group's ground rules. That's a good idea. Talk about housekeeping things like where's the bathroom, right. there's drinks over here, you know, if you need to take a phone call, here's where you can go to take a phone call because, That's a good point. because we know that everybody's busy and there's stuff going on. We're only going to be here for an hour, but, you know, um, we ask, you know, if your group decides you don't want people texting during the group, then talk about it. You know, what should we do with our phones? Um, decide on some things together. But then when you talk about keeping people with a purpose, okay, here's the time frame. We're going to introduce ourselves. We're going to do this. We're right. going to do that. We're going to do that. That way, if somebody gets off topic during the Bible study part, you can bring them back and say, well, we've got a couple minutes at the end. If you want to talk right. about that, we could talk about it. Or remember, we said that at the beginning, we talk about how we talk about what happened during the week or whatever. Right. Now we're on this part. So, you know, um, this isn't the time for that. Right. To go back to the rules. Because sometimes if you don't set any rules or you don't say anything, that's where it becomes a free-for-all. And then people get mad because they don't understand the concept. They don't know what your expectations are. And it may sound strange, but even, you know, what if you invite somebody who smokes to your house, but you don't want people smoking in your house? That Good might point. be another ground rule that you talk about. That if you smoke, you know, feel free to... You know, smoke outside my house before you come in or after you leave, but, you know, it's a smoke-free zone or whatever. I think setting expectations are just extremely helpful and sticking uh, to a time. You, you, you can tell my wife is an expert at this stuff. <laughs> she does this all the time. So those are really good points, Jen and, and Ella. And uh, um, this is, you know, these ground rules, some of these ground rules are going to be in your small group booklets. So they're going to be right at the front. If you would like, as Ella indicated, I think it's kind of nice sometimes to make a poster of that. And uh, that was kind of one of the other things I was going to add, and I think she's exactly right. Add your own ground rules. In fact, the very first time, just say, look, are there any ground rules that we need to make sure that we, uh, for this? And, and they're going to be unique to your particular group. So I think good points to both of you. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Inviting others to bring snacks for next week. I think that's an important thing. I think the very first... The very first time that uh, you have your group, you should probably provide the snacks. But one of the things that should be included in the conversation for the next week is, is there somebody else, is some, would somebody be willing to bring the snacks for next week? Kind of shares the burden with that because you should not be the one shouldering that all the time. But people like to show off the stuff that they bring, you know, and, and whatever. It's just kind of nice. Um, so that, that, that helps people invest in the group. Um, it is never too late to invite a friend. If you're two or three weeks into the, uh, into the small group and you're wondering whether or not you should invite that friend that you didn't think about last week or the week before, the answer to that is, yeah, as long as the small group is okay with that. You might want to throw that off your small group. Look, is it okay? I've got a friend that I was thinking of I think would really benefit from this. So I think it's important for you as small group leaders to um, monitor that and an ask your group because you also don't want to upset the apple cart in your small group. So you're going to have to make that evaluation. There also might be somebody in your group that says, look, I have a friend, I think, that could benefit from this. 
once again, make sure that that's discussed as a group if, it, if you're midway into the small group. Okay? Uh, that's what I said, make sure the group is in agreement. Groups, um, gr a group is anywhere from 2 to 12 people. You get 13, 14, 15 people, what happens? The group becomes unmanageable, becomes difficult. There's a reason why Jesus chose 12 disciples and not 13. It is something that's kind of built into our DNA, into our biology. When we get groups bigger than 12 people, then it starts to become dominated by one or two people, and most people just kind of fade in the background and never feel like they can participate. Do not, under any circumstances, allow this to get much any bigger than that. If we need to, we will split the group. We'll just have to. It's just the way it is. But, uh, so that's important. Honestly, five, six, seven, eight people is kind of like an ideal small group. That's like a perfect size. It's small enough that everybody cares about each other, but it's, it, it's, uh, but it's big enough that people who really just want to sit can get lost a little bit too. So, anyway, so good discussion is hindered by anything larger. And like I said, the one thing that Ella mentioned about adding your own ground rules, make sure you do that. I think the idea about the phones, as she mentioned, is a really good thing too. Especially in this day and age, if you've got people under the age of 40, um, they're just constantly, I know, I'm trying to be kind, uh, they're constantly reaching for their phones. And, you know, I was out with my, you know, with our cousin one day and, um, and his wife and at dinner, and, and just both of them were like, <sighs> we're sitting here talking to them. Uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. What was that? You know, they're missing half of it. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. half, half the meal was, was spent with them texting to somebody, and it's crazy. So I think it's kind of a good idea. One of the things we do in Young Life, uh, which again, small group, the same type of principle, we tell them that they have to turn off their cell phones when they come to small group. We have one person whose Bible is on her phone, but we could still talk okay. about use it for well, that. Just that use and that's that. fine, that's fine. But yeah, they can't be uh, answering texts or doing this and doing that. And, Almost everything they would answer text for can wait an hour. You know, there's nothing pressing, all right? Unless it's an emergency, and that doesn't happen very often in our lives. Okay, so those are, again, about small group rules. You need them, you love them, you got to live by them. Time frame. Let me stop it because you two are so helpful with that. Anything else about small group rules? I did like, again, I mentioned about making sure everybody knows where the bathrooms are. That's really important. You know, those things are, are, are just so critical that we make sure people are feeling comfortable. Time frame. Uh, this is my suggested time frame. You may modify this as you see fit because you are the expert in your small group. However, this is my recommendation, at least as a starting point. All right? Speaking of that, oh, I was making sure I didn't get a comment. We had a comment, but it wasn't about that, so... All right, so time frame. Um, my encouragement is the very first 15 to 20 minutes you spend in just checking in with each other. This is where the music is really important. There are going to be one or two people that connect a little bit better with each other, and they might gravitate towards those folks. And your job is just to make sure everybody's comfortable, that somebody's not standing over in a corner by themselves like this. Invite them in. Make sure that they're taken care of. Because you, you have a job. Your job is to make everybody comfortable. Okay? Some people like standing over in a corner by themselves, so you have to evaluate that too. But other folks are just, again, those folks that just are waiting to be invited in, they don't know how to do it. Because maybe they lack the social skills to be able to do that. So you know them. You're their pastor, remember. Invite them in. Invite them into conversation in some way. Okay? So 15 to 20 minutes in formal conversation. Some groups sometimes get a little bit more directed with this. They all sit down in a circle, and you say, hey, let's check in. That's an appropriate way to do it, too. Especially when people don't, you know, maybe know anybody in the group, and nobody knows anybody. I have often will sit down, and we'll, we'll say, hey, look, I know none of us know each other. Let's just, you know, yeah, it's common to share your name. Hey, what's, your, what's, what's the, your favorite movie you've seen in the last month? It's something non-threatening that people can talk about. And all, or what's your favorite band? What's, what's, the, what's the band that you're listening to right now? What's the music you're listening to? What's the TV show you're listening to? Something that's very non-threatening gets people talking about it. When people start to get comfortable with each other, you might be able to ask a little more directed questions in that check-in time. You know, what's going on? Is there anything for which, that we need to pray for, for you this week? 
That you've got to be careful of because it depends on whether the group is ready for it. Yes, Ellen? So we do an exercise with M&Ms, mm -hmm. and they have to pick a colored M&M, and then we have a topic. And they don't know what the topic is, they just pick the M&M. So like if you picked a brown M&M, mm -hmm. it might be, what's your favorite movie? If you picked a green M&M, it might be somebody you respect. If you picked a yellow M&M, it That's might good. be, what's your favorite food? So that could be something, and then everybody gets to eat the M&Ms afterwards. So it's cheap, and it's, you know, people don't know what they're picking, because people are always afraid usually to talk. Right. So it's just a nice way. And then we talk about, you know, what's a couple things that people are afraid of. Because in the class, they have to stand up and introduce themselves. But, um, well, they have to introduce each other. But that's just kind of a nice little icebreaker because people don't know what the colors represent when they pick them. So right. it's kind of a surprise afterwards of, oh, okay. Yeah. You know. I, think it's, I think it's a great idea. We will be, I will be posting some icebreaker type of things that you can do and it's whatever works for your group I like the one Ella suggested maybe she can even write that down and we'll post that along with it this is a great idea you have to evaluate your group these may work for your group they may not I mean, your group might know each other they may all be friends you're not going to need to do this but even even in that group it might be fun you know to do something like that too you know just just something funny that they can laugh at they, they may all be friends but they may be uncomfortable with what's going to take place here and so this just kind of breaks the ice so we'll post a bunch of icebreakers that you can do but once you get into a pattern you're going to figure out the best way to spend that 15 to 20 minutes it just is important that whatever by the time that you guys are done with this that people know each other and are at least invested in each other's lives to care for each other that's ultimately the goal with that yes i was just thinking and i know this isn't our topic but like with the icebreaker things, even people that know each other, like mm -hmm. one of them in the book that you might be posting was, you put a line down the middle of the room and then you ask questions like, right. and we all knew each other, it was a work group, but it was like, would you rather eat right. peas would or you rather, would you rather have a cinnamon roll? Right. Would you so rather, rather yeah. fly on a plane or would you rather stay home and paint your house? Those kind of things. It just gets people talking because afterwards, even though we knew each other, like, People were like, seriously, you'd rather, you don't want to go to the Bahamas, you'd rather stay home and paint your house. Like, it opens <laughs> a conversation right. where you're, you learn a little bit more. Like 2000, good yeah. the Bahamas, really? Yeah, but yeah. it's nothing that's threatening. It just makes kind of non-threatening conversation that opens the door to talk about things that everybody's more comfortable with, like right. travel or food or things, you know, you're not, you're not delving into politics and religion, which are right. things that drive people nuts. Yeah, so. and no politics in the, and I, I'm really begging you folks, please do not get into politics in this. One of the things that I think we've had such a nice thing in our church is that I know for a fact that I have the extremes and everything in between politically in this church from very far left-wingers to very far right-wingers, and we get along just peachy and fine because we share Christ and, and, uh, and that other stuff. I don't mind people talking about it outside of the context of things, but you're in this group type of setting or in the church, you know, I just think those things are just divisive and have no place. Okay, so um, I think it's great. This is probably the most important time of the small group because it sets the tone for everything else that takes place. You have to be prepared. It is better to be over prepared and have more than what you're going to use. Again, keep it to 15 to 20 minutes, okay? Um, there you go. Awesome, awesome suggestions. Uh, this, the next part is a question mark. In fact, you can even put the second bullet point question mark because it really depends on the group. Five to 10 minute worship time. Um, probably no for 90% of the groups. It's probably just not even gonna happen. I will make music available for you that yeah, I, I, I would be frank with you I think the last time we did this I don't think any groups used it because it just didn't seem to fit with any of the groups but if your group is really a student loves to worship and, and is a church typically tends to be a church group we'll make it available for you but I don't want to spend too much time on that but I'm saying basically you can pull out one song let's sing the song together pray together that's fine if it works for your group but again that is something that you would add because you feel it will work for your group, but I'm not even encouraging you to have it. 
if you don't feel like it would work with your group. I hope that's clear enough. Okay, my group, I can guarantee you, we will not have music at a worship time in my group. Just isn't going to happen because they would be uncomfortable with it. Okay, so we've done, we've introduced ourselves, but what I would ask you to do is to start with prayer at this point. So if any prayer concerns, so instead of, that is the part of this that I, sh I should, it may not be a five to ten minute worship time, but it will be a prayer time. You may, may have heard some concerns that people have. I guarantee you those concerns are distracting them from being in this place, this space right now. So what you can do as a leader, and I know some people are uncomfortable praying, but I, I hope as those of you who are announcing yourselves as leaders, this shouldn't be too difficult. All you have to do is say, hey, let's bow our heads in prayer and say, God, you heard the concerns that are in people's hearts today. You know they distract us from our time here to do, uh, together. Help us to, to open up your word and, and, and be changed by it. Help us to overcome these distractions during this time so that we might focus on what it is you want to say to us. Amen. Or, I'll tell you what, I had a professor in college, Dr. Schultz, who would say, the first time you hear him, it's like, this, this is crazy. He'd say, all right, he'd start every, every day by saying, let us pray, and we'd all be, okay. Okay. Are you going to pray? And about, uh, what, two minutes later, he'd say, amen. <laughs> okay. And that was his prayer. He wouldn't pray anything. It was just like you individually. If that's the best thing for your group, just say, hey, we're going to take a moment of silence to prepare our hearts, and let's pray. And then each one of you individually can bring your prayers before God. I would be careful about doing the popcorn type of prayers, if you know what I mean by that, where you're saying, let's open it up to other people, uh, unless you are comfortable with your group. Once again, I told you there are people who like to dominate things, there are people who will dominate that prayer time, and you will have a 20 minute prayer about all the things that's wrong in their life. Okay, so you have to be careful of that. Uh, you don't want that to happen. All right. So going on, so prayer or worship time, uh, 10 minute video, I told you at that point, so we prayed, you've had your uh, small, you, uh, one of the icebreakers, you've done your short prayer, you go straight into uh, the video. Now, oftentimes my lessons, it will be a lesson plan for you, sometimes it will say read this verse first. And then it might say, use these words to introduce the video. So I will be very specific about how to do that. So it will say, read this. Well, we're going to read from 1 John chapter 1, verse 4. And then Pastor Dave is going to do a lesson on this. And so you introduced my lesson. You show that 10-minute video. After the 10-minute video, there's discussion time. The lesson plans that you will have for this will have about five or six questions that should help you interact with the video and also the, the lesson. You'll, you'll probably interact with one or two ideas that were mentioned in, the, in my video. Um, sometimes, let me think of a good example. One thing we'll, you know, we might start with what are, what are things wrong in the world today? I don't know, I'm just throwing that off the top of my head. That won't be exactly one of the questions. But um, how do I contribute to the, such and such a problem in the world? Or whatever, I don't know. I'm just uh, there might be some type of question that gets you into the Bible study, you read the lesson, then you interact with the, the lesson and the, and the uh, video and so forth. And so that will help direct the lesson uh, for you for that day. Now if you get to the point where you folks are going on a really interesting conversation that has nothing to do with my questions, but has everything to do with the lesson for today, guess what you should do? Let it go! Keep it going! Alright? My stuff is a guideline. Probably 85% of the time you're going to find that you're going to follow the lessons that I have listed for you. But if you've got a great conversation that's going on and it's just going back and it's really intense and people are just really engaging with this and you're only getting to that one question in that 20 minutes, good for you. Because you've got to get to what, what's meaningful for your group. And what's meaningful to me may not be what's meaningful to your group. I hope that makes some sense. Again, use my thing as a guideline. That's why you have to be prepared. It's always better to be prepared. When you're prepared, you can riff. If you understand what that is, that's a, usually used for uh, uh, musicians and so forth. If a musician learns all the scales and so forth, and they're comfortable with the way the music is going, then they can kind of make things up 
in the middle there sometimes and, and, and take it in some unusual directions. If you're really familiar with what you're going to do that day and you're comfortable with it, it also gives you the comfort to be able to going off in, uh, in a direction that maybe is not directly in the Bible study, but you feel your group needs to go in. Okay? Um, but for those less comfortable with that, I know we've got some really strong leaders that would be comfortable with that. For those of you who are not comfortable with that, uh, I would say just stick to the script. Okay? Especially if it's your first time. Stick to the script. Spend a couple of minutes on each question. Just what we'd said to you about how to engage people in conversation. They're looking like this and they're ready to go. I'm saying this again. Then ask them, hey, what are you thinking? Just like Jen said. Just, hey, what are you thinking about this question? What do you think about this? What do you have to add? Okay. Once you're done with that, again, time of 20 minutes, you may not get to all of the questions. That's okay. When you get to the end of 20 minutes, you say, well, listen, I, you know, we don't have time to get to the other questions. You're welcome to take that home for your personal devotion today. Or if you'd like to talk to me about it, we can talk about it through the week. It gives you more discussion to get with that person during the week. But you want to cut it off after 20 minutes. Because what did I tell you again? How long should these small groups be? 75 minutes at most. An hour to 75 minutes. You don't want to test people. So cut it off and say, well, listen, I just think this encourages people. I just, I hope, encourage the people at this point say, I'm really appreciative of your input. Thank them for that so they feel valued. And, and then say, listen, I'm just going to take a few minutes to pray for you for this week. And again, I, I have five minutes there. It might be a 30-second prayer. Okay? You just say, thank God for everybody. You can even mention each, each of the people by name. God bless, bless us this week as we prepare to, to take this lesson out. And amen. If you've got another person who's comfortable praying, I, as I mentioned, you sometimes you'll have in your group a really strong person who is, is really good. Like I said, if I had Terry with me in my group, which I won't, by the way. He's got his own group. But if I had Terry in my group and I were closing with prayer, I'd say, you know, and I'd clear this with Terry beforehand to make sure he'd be comfortable closing with prayer. And if he is, then I'll let him close with prayer so it doesn't feel like I'm the one dominating the whole group the whole time. Even though I'm the leader, sometimes it's good to spread these things out. And that's something to keep in mind. If you see somebody who's really strong, who looks like they could lead a group or would be good at this, you might even want to have them participate in some of the leadership of that. And so that's always a strength in a small group when you have uh, two leaders as opposed to one. All right, notice I have flex time at the end. So you finished your prayer. That flex time is your time to be able to push those people out. That 15-minute flex time can be, you know, in case you ended up spending an extra five minutes in conversation uh, because you just thought it was an important conversation. You know, it just gives you, you, you can use that 15 minutes wherever you want or if you get done in an hour and you're just so ready for this group to get home, get them out of here. Okay? Send them home. Be nice, but send them home. Okay. But that's just, again, flex time to use for other things in case it runs over and uh, for one reason or another. Okay. Um, there are a lot of things. That, I, that may or may not be in her mind from other types of emergencies. Things do come up in the group that maybe somebody's struggling with a major issue. Um, I want you to be sensitive to these things, but also cognizant of the fact that if you have seven other people in your group and one person is struggling with a personal crisis, the other, the other six people may not be prepared or wanting to deal with some of that. Okay? So you have to... We have to be sensitive to those things. If somebody's got a major burden, they could literally dominate the entire hour and steal away the opportunity for folks to get in the Bible study. Um, what you may need to do is, uh, in some cases, say, look, you know, um, is just say, hey, what we'll do is we can keep on the agenda of this Bible study for today, and afterwards maybe you and I can sit and talk about this some. So, uh, you know, be cognizant of those things. You'll have to recognize that that's going to happen. But you still have to be aware there's other people in your group you have to care for. And they don't want to necessarily sit and talk for an hour about somebody's problems. Now, I'm not saying that ultimately that is what a small group is there to do, but not everybody's prepared for that. So, Okay, any other questions?
about the time frame or concerns about any, let's just look at the time frame and then we'll open up to any other questions. Yes, Ella? So one of the things we talk about is we tell people that we're going to do the three S's. We're going to start on time, we're going to stay on time, and we're going to stop on time. Right. And we pick somebody, usually you be the timekeeper, okay. because whether you think it or not, sometimes, like you said, you start down a conversation and what you think was going to take two minutes because you're yeah. like, oh, this is easy, mm -hmm. turns into 20 minutes. So that might be where, as the leader, like you have, you know, I say, okay, Pastor Dave, you're going to be the timekeeper. Not that you're going to necessarily interrupt me, but you're going to maybe hold up two fingers for the two-minute warning so that I can help gauge and move the conversation along. Right. And then if you have another leader that's with you, like maybe you discover you have a, somebody who can kind of co-lead later on, maybe they can also tag team with you later on down the road if you find out you have one person right. who tends to be the time hog and one or both of you can kind of you know tag team and say okay well we've just got a couple minutes and then we're going to move along to the next segment which is we're going to move into the prayer or we're going to move into right. the ending because i think um, one of the things that really ticks people off in today's day and age whether it's a class it's work it's personal things is that Everybody's scheduled so tight right. that when you say 75 minutes, they That'd need to know it's 75 minutes because they may never come back again, not because they don't mm -hmm. like you, not because they didn't like the content, but because they can't trust that you're going to keep your commitment. Right. And it is hard when you get into a group of people because the time just tends to go so fast. It does. So It does. Well, I think it's a great idea. Maybe we'll put that on there too, uh, as far as under the ground rules. Just again, if you'd like to have, I do like the three S's of stay, start, stop. I think it's a great idea. And it is good to have your Hulk Hogan there who can tag in and, and, and slam somebody on the mat and help you out with that. But speaking of which, we are, you know, I did promise it'd be about an hour and a half. We're about an hour, 35 minutes into it. I want to take maybe two more minutes and then I think we need to be done here. So let me just ask if there are any other comments or questions about anything about time frame or generic anything else on the agenda for today. Okay. So is everybody clear? Let me just wrap this up with this. Everybody's clear about the time frame. We've got one more week to start recruiting your group and getting people engaged with that. I will be in communication with all of you leaders in this next week to make sure that you have everything you need, which will include... Um, the scripts for the, uh, for the lessons, the lesson plans, the individual daily devotions. You will be responsible to hand out daily devotionals for people in your small group or at least know how to direct them to, what was that again? Holy Trinity East PGH. I know you guys are laughing at me, but how often do people have to see things before they get it? Oh, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, ten times. So I'm doing it again. Holy Trinity East PGH. Your resource for all things small group in this campaign. You will be able to get there. So, But I just need to make sure that everybody understands everything. I will be in communication with you. Make sure you're comfortable. I do want to know who is in your, well, at least kind of a generic thing of who's in your group. Any way I can be of help. I'm here to be a pastor to you so that you can be a pastor to the people in your small group. And that's how this is going to work. All right, well, thank you. I appreciate your time. I am going to close in prayer and bless you guys and ask God's blessing on you this week. And I thank you for your attention. Again, those online, very grateful you took your time to make sure that you understand this. I am encouraging you to be in touch with me with any questions you might have since you were not able to interact with me. Maybe there are some things that you missed or didn't hear that Jen or Ellis said. I, uh, I think they just had some fantastic comments to add to that. I would be able to clarify some of those things as well, too. Let us, uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, I am grateful again for this opportunity. Uh, I'm thankful for those here today uh, who had the opportunity to interact with me about the needs of these small groups and how important they are. Because I believe that this campaign is going to really connect people to Christ that maybe have not had that opportunity before. And most importantly, uh, it will connect us to each other. Well, to Christ, that's most importantly, but also to each other because I think that's a part of our relationship with Christ and that's exactly what this whole campaign is about. How do we connect to Christ? By connecting to each other. And so I'm asking that you use these groups to bless people, God, and to grow their faith during these 40 days. 
Send us forth in peace, we ask, for it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all, and God bless you. So, I'm going to practice this. And God bless you all. Anybody need their coat? No, we'll see. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Terry. Thank you, Vanna. Vanna Terry. Vanna Terry. Vain Terry. Vain. I was thinking myself, Kristen, when you talk about that, let them know, hey, it's a school.